Good evening and greetings again from Baltimore. I so wish that we could all be together or that at least I could be in the Trinity Sanctuary, but neither of those opportunities is possible just now. Yet it remains an honor and a pleasure to share with you the Word of God on this Monday, Thursday. Tonight we consider the events of the Upper Room with Jesus and his disciples, and I reflect on that event from this Upper Room. Tomorrow evening, Pastor Jennings will be in the sanctuary for the observance of Good Friday. On Saturday evening, the elders will be sharing with you a complete reading of the Passion of our Lord as we meditate in that time between the cross and the open tomb. And then on Sunday morning, Pastor Jennings will be once again in the sanctuary with three or four musicians celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. We pray that the services and meditations that we can offer this weekend are indeed a blessing for you and your family in most peculiar times. We are reminded that the certainty, the assurance of the promise of our Lord is every bit the same this year as every year, as we recognize Christ crucified, died, and risen for us. May the Lord be with you. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. I invite you to speak aloud or meditate upon this excerpt from Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, on this night you instituted the gift of your body and blood in bread and wine for the forgiveness of sins, and you demonstrated love in humble serving. Be with us as we are separated from your table and from one another. Grant us faith to know that you are present with all of us this night and guide us to share with others the love that comes from above, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear the word of our Lord. First, the Old Testament reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 24. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars, according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel 
who burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 17 and 31 through 35. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to listen to or sing with this Monday Thursday hymn that imagines what it must have been like on this day for our Lord when you woke that Thursday morning.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. We reflect this night, of course, upon the Gospel of John. The week had begun in festive joy. Already by Thursday of that week, though, one can imagine that the disciples were really looking forward to some time alone with the Master, a private place in which to celebrate the Passover meal, and time away from the crowds and the growing controversy, and perhaps time to learn a little bit more about the future plans of this mysterious leader. In that upper room where they gathered, perhaps there was no one of lowly enough status to greet them properly when they first arrived. Perhaps traditional customs didn't seem to apply at that moment. The master had certainly broken with traditional customs in the past. But whatever the case, they entered the room from the dusty streets below and proceeded directly to gather around the table for the meal. Two customary objects had been laid out in the room during the preparations, but everyone seemed to be ignoring them. Whether the, whether the disciples had privately noticed and looked the other way or simply were caught up in the moment, we don't know. But a basin and a towel sat idle. That is, until Jesus got up from dinner without warning. There is no record that he spoke a word of explanation. John simply describes how Jesus took off his outer clothing, picked up the towel and wrapped it around his waist. He poured water into the basin. And imagine the shock of the first disciple, we don't know who it was, in front of whom Jesus knelt and began to wash this man's feet. That man's reaction is unrecorded probably because he just sat in stunned silence, like the next man and the next. Only Peter protests and is gently rebuked. For three years, these men had followed him, hanging on his every word, marveling at his power over demons, nature, opponents, even death. And now he is before them performing the lowliest task imaginable. Jesus asks, do you understand what I have done for you? It must be a rhetorical question, since Jesus knew the only honest answer any of the disciples could have offered would have sounded something like, of course not. Of course we don't understand why the one who comes from God would also stoop so low as to wash our feet. There has long been a trend in American labor where numerous agricultural and food service jobs go unfilled by American citizens. The work is often considered too strenuous or too menial and the pay considered too, many, too minimal to attract workers from a society accustomed to a higher standard of living, at least by most global standards. And so those jobs are often done by recent immigrants, many undocumented, or here temporarily. Here in Maryland, almost the entire crab picking industry is sustained this way. Local residents often don't want that lousy job, certainly not for the money offered. Now we'll see what happens in when our strained Economy begins to recover in months ahead, but it is still illustrate an illustration of how some jobs can be considered beneath one station. It's tempting to think, I would never stoop so low for such a job. Jesus would. He did stoop to the lowest of jobs, and in doing so, he simply explains. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, 
I have set for you an example of what it means to be a servant. You must be willing to do even this kind of menial act for one another, just as I have done it for you. They cannot yet understand, the disciples, the full impact of Jesus and what he is saying. John records much of Jesus' teaching that night, and there are several times in which the disciples clearly do not understand where Jesus is going with his teaching. But this act itself, washing someone else's feet, that would have been clear enough to them. They can see it and feel it and slowly begin to grasp the nature of what it means to truly serve. In these burdened weeks that we are in, this upper room scene has a special relevance. We see, perhaps more clearly than we might normally, the abundance of self-sacrificial service being done by so many. Close and intimate care is being offered, so often for strangers, where whoever is in need, sometimes at great personal risk. These jobs of humble service are not new to our culture, but newly highlighted because of the scale of the illness and the suffering that plagues the globe. And a reminder of what is truly essential in this life, however menial or inglorious it may appear. In our home now come two ladies, Kristen and Tawanda, to offer such gentle care. We all know that this whole ordeal is intruded upon by relentless politics, sharp disagreements, accusations, and recriminations. But for now, look beyond all of that and focus instead on the givers, the hands that wash feet, the feet of the ill and dying. Look at the hands of those who carry food wherever it is needed, at the hands of those who labor around the clock in search of a cure. Look at the lives that truly reflect what Jesus instructed, as I have done this for you, so you should do so for one another. If you are such a caregiver, May God be glorified by the love you demonstrate. And it doesn't just happen out in professional work settings. It's happening in homes, countless homes, where we care for one another in ways that may have never been a part of routine, but are becoming more common day by day. And as we impart whatever care is necessary, Recall that your love for one another has its source in God's love for you. And yet, this Monday Thursday also clearly reminds us that as important and loving as our greatest acts of sacrificial service can be, they still do not tip the scales of human brokenness. Apart from Christ, Sin still reigns. We still need, as much as ever, the complete and intentional sacrifice of our Lord. Jesus was not just being kind that night. Jesus was not just placing himself at risk. He was deliberately placing his perfect, sinless life on a path toward crucifixion. His deliberate walk toward the cross declares the depth of Jesus' love and his commitment to fulfill the history-long promises of God toward all the lowly, even to us. Jesus' greatest act of humility, death on a cross, 
results in washing away all the filth of sin that separates you from God, making you truly clean, truly whole, by the cleansing, healing power of his blood. And here Jesus also demonstrates his own words. Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. And so he did. How unbelievable it must have seemed to the disciples to feel Jesus washing their feet. How peculiar it must have seemed to later watch and listen as he took a loaf of bread, broke it, and passed it to them with these words, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. What could he mean? They must have wondered. So too with the cup. Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Again, they must have been perplexed. In the course of one Passover meal, our Lord leaves for his disciples and for us an example of true humility and love. What it truly means to be a servant. And in the same meal, he institutes a sacrament of God's love and forgiveness, what it means to be a part of Christ. Well, from whatever room today in which you ponder this extraordinary scene, I pray that you are led by the example of our Lord to continue on the path of faithful service to those whom our Lord has placed around you. And I pray that you are assured again that by your own faith in Jesus, you are served by him in this life, redeemed by his death, healed to the very depth of your soul, and upheld in the ever-loving arms of God himself. From the upper room, Jesus goes on to the garden and further on toward the cross. Follow him in these coming days of sacrifice until we all gather together again at the empty tomb. Amen. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which far surpasses our human understanding, Guard your hearts and minds this night and always. Amen. The Apostles' Creed has been spoken by people in the church the world over for centuries. It unites us around our common faith. And so I invite you to speak aloud or meditate upon these familiar words of confession. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, on this holy night, when your Son set aside his glory and honor and showed his love by washing the feet of his friends, enable us to so follow his example and willingly serve those around us, that others might know we are yours by such love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, on this holy night, when your Son gifted his church with the sacramental meal of his body and blood, grant that we may soon gather again to faithfully receive this gift 
that his life might be manifested in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, on this holy night, when your Son united his church in the fellowship of his body and blood, bless our brothers and sisters throughout the world. Strengthen us all in the confession of your truth and help us to faithfully proclaim it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, on this holy night, when your Son was handed over as our Paschal Lamb, that death might pass over us, pour out your Spirit upon us, that we might keep in remembrance his holy passion in repentance and faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Joined with the whole church on earth, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In recognition of our Lord's passion and in preparation for the solemn worship of Good Friday, the altar is traditionally stripped of communion ware and all other liturgical adornments. Our absence from the sanctuary tonight is more than symbol enough of the burden of this broken world and how desolate life would truly be were it not for our Lord's incomparable sacrifice, which we observe tomorrow. Peace be with you.